earth science and the topic we're going to look at in this lecture is groundwater and wetlands and in the picture there you see um, groundwater in the middle of the picture where you have saturated soil and that's what we're talking about when we look at groundwater wetlands would be when the groundwater when would be when groundwater uh, comes to the surface and there's some questions we want to look at just to get us thinking about groundwater and wetlands uh, which of the following have you experienced or observed? An underground cave, a spring, a wetland? Another question, how, how often do you drink bottled water? Uh, when at home, do you more likely drink bottled water or water from a tap? And why do you make that choice? Another question to think about. List all the things you use in water for and around your in your home. In addition, what other ways is water used in your community? And another question, what's the number one health problem in the world today? That is a clean supply of water. Um, abundant, clean water is the greatest health problem afflicting the world today. At one time we um, tried to find water with a water, water witch. And um, my dad swears that he's seen people do that and it worked for him. Um, but anyway, <laughs> we also have... Um, a directive to go you there for um, folks that are in, in mission organizations that go and drink wa uh, dig water wells in parts of the world where people desperately need clean abundant um, supplies of water and here you see people testing water um, and uh, and very happily um, pumping water and there you also see a picture of um, a well with um, water supplied around the well at a, at a pumping station up in the upper right. Living water. Jesus is living water, but he used that as an analogy of clean supply of fresh water to talk about himself. I remember being on a mission trip to Kenya, and we stayed at a very nice uh, <clears throat> very nice a, uh, a conference center in Nairobi, Kenya. And I remember coming home from that trip being awestruck with just how wonderful it was to be able to turn on my tap water here in the United States and be able to drink it. Um, because if I'd, if I'd been drinking the water there at that nice conference center, it would have had typhoid in it. And uh, so which is better to drink, uh, the bottled water or the tap water that we put lots of money into in this country to clean up? I really think it's an ethical question, too. It's something to think about. Um, <clears throat> both, both go through the similar processes to clean it. Both go through similar monitoring processes to clean it. In fact, the tap water probably goes through more, more stringent monitoring processes. Here in the, here, and I'm talking about the United States here. I'm not talking about other countries. Well, the consumption of bottled water in the U.S. is growing fast, faster than any other beverage. And at, at least in the United States, tap water is just as good and costs a whole lot less. And again, there's that ethical question. You know, <laughs> other countries that really need clean, fresh, abundant water would um, chop off their left arm to have what we have. Um, about a fourth of all bottled water is just simply bottled tap water. And purified water, it's gone through uh, reverse osmosis or something and, and um, taken out some things. Now there's parts of the country that have bad water. Uh, but um, that, that's not true in general in this country. Well, where does our drinking water come from? Well, it comes from lakes and streams on the Earth's surface. Some comes from rivers and also from groundwater and the title of this lecture is ground, groundwater um, and um, as we know um, from actually actually may not know but um, in the last lecture we talked about uh, <clears throat> lakes and streams and rivers get much of their water from groundwater so it's it all goes together you can't separate out one from the other one of the problems we have and worldwide we have is water supplies get contaminated by humans and um, 
the U.S. has 53,000 community water systems, and some of those get polluted. And we saw in the news some time back that uh, there was a spill into a river in West Virginia, and the water got polluted, and the people couldn't drink it. It was a real problem. It still is a problem, perhaps, in some, in some ways for them. And cleanup can be tricky. There's a map of an example from Woburn, Massachusetts, and it's a case where there were several sources of potential sources of pollution and children were diagnosed after their mothers drank water from two polluted wells while they were pregnant. So old industrial sites are a real problem for making sure we have clean, fresh, abundant drinking water. So what happened there is the families accused the companies of illegally dumping chemicals, geologists came in and studied the interactions between local rock and water systems to try and determine you know what's the source of those of those of those pollutants is there is there a source or is it a kind of a non-source and um, uh, so they figured out the distance of each company from the wells they determined the properties of the chemicals that were in the water they looked at the local geology and um, uh, there was a company that ended up settling and the surrounding landowners um, coughed up money along with um, the EPA to clean it up and there's a national priorities list with um, sites around the US where contamination is a problem and a fourth of the US population lives within um, four miles of one of those national priorities list sites. Let's look at the hydrologic cycle and just uh, think about it a bit. Here's a cartoon ver so you get evaporation from the ocean, most of it from the ocean, and what happens is you get condensed clouds into clouds, and then precipitation from those clouds land, and then infiltrate water into the ground, and there you see the blue is our water table, and um, you also get transp transpiration and evaporation, um, uh, transpiration from trees, evaporation from the land, and we call that evapotranspiration together, ET. Um, you also get runoff uh, from um, water that does not infiltrate into the ground. And um, there's a stream flow where you get runoff as well as groundwater going into the, um, the blue is the water. And uh, so you get groundwater flow that runs downhill just like on top of land or um, <clears throat> in groundwater goes down or water runs downhill it does underground as well and uh, that stream and then on into the ocean and uh, so the base flow on that groundwater flow we're looking at is where the um, water flows into a uh, body of water from underground again that's a term that you'll need to know that base flow is where just like in a river it's it's the um, it's where groundwater flows into a, a body of water and then um, from the stream then you get another groundwater to the left of the stream and the base flow there would be in the ocean so you get multiple base flows depending on the body of water it's running into and so then you get subsurface outflow okay um, the earth's um, groundwater flows through um, holes in earth material we call those pores and the pores are between the grains of, um, of what's in the earth and that could be bedrock, it could be a regolith, it could be uh, just uh, anything under the earth and the pores are the um, the definition would be the proportion of a material that's made up of spaces so if, if half of a rock is made up of grains then 50 percent of that would be pores and be, you'd have 50 percent porosity and depending on the uh, size and arrangement and sorting of the uh, material will depend on what kind of porosity you get if you have a well sorted material you get better porosity because then you don't have smaller like clays and stuff filling in the cracks in between the larger grains. here's a diagram that might be useful to think about that um, if the same kind of pictures on the lower left and in the in the picture that where it's looking pinker than blue you can see um, white spaces 
between the blue the blue water and the pink grains well those white spaces would be air well below the water table you don't see those white spaces and that's because there is um, it's saturated so those holes are full of water those those pores that porosity is full of water and uh, where the line between there is called the water table now also notice in the um, uh, picture there's a sea area where there's kind of a shale ridge. Well, there's another water table on top of that. And so you get multiple layers of multiple water tables um, depending on the geology. That's why it's good to look at this whole um, geological and um, uh, earth. Uh, geology is part of earth system because there's lots going on. And so this is an example of porosity. Sponges have pores in them and the sponge part is the like the grains and the holes in the sponge are like and um, as grains get compacted and cemented the porosity decreases and so on the left you have the original sediment it hasn't been compacted and it starts to get compacted and then you start to cement it and there's less space between those grains with compaction and cementation. So do you think porosity is higher in unconsolidated material or in the rock equivalent? Well, it's greater in unconsolidated material because it hasn't been packed or cemented. Um, here's some terms that are important to know. Uh, specific yield, a groundwater that can drain from a rock or sediment. Um, so specific yield is uh, porosity minus the specific retention. And if we do an exercise where we um, take dry sand and pour water into it, to the top of the sand and measure the amount of water we pour into it. So you, you know, take a, take a glass and put sand in it and then take a um, measuring cup or a measuring um, flask and measure how much water you put into that to the top of the sand. Then dump the water out of the measuring, um, measuring glass and dump the water back out of the uh, glass until the sand is still moist. Well, that moist sand is what's called specific retention. So it's the water on the surface of the grains that will not flow through the material. It's stuck and adheres to the grain surfaces. So that's, that's not that hard a concept. It's a specific yield is porosity. In other words, the space between those sand grains and specific retention is the water that's stuck to or adheres to each of the sand grains. Here's another diagram that shows some of the important uh, picture of words that you need to know and uh, also does it with pictures instead of um, language. And so we have the top of the picture, we have what's called a zone of aeration. Well that's like we talked about a minute ago where you have grains of material with um, water um, uh, stuck to those grains of material. Remember that's called specific retention. And then also air uh, between the grains and the, uh, and the adhered water. And uh, so that's the zone of aeration. Then you have a zone of saturation where that air is missing and there's, most, there's just water between the grains of sand or clay or gravel or whatever's in that. And um, so if you have a, on the lower left, um, you can have different types of material with different, um, uh, different properties that affect groundwater. On the lower left you have sand and gravel and lots of different sedimentary rocks where you have openings like the picture we looked at. But then also you can get fractures and um, igneous metamorphic and sedimentary rocks might have fractures in them like, um, like that idea of granite we've talked about where it can break up and then water can go through the fractures. And then in limestone you get a lot of caverns in limestone where um, the water because it's slightly acidic will eat out the limestone and um, so you get caverns just rivers of water going through that limestone. Another concept that's important to know is what's called permeability and that's the capacity of water to flow through earth materials. Permeability, um, don't get that mixed up with porosity. Porosity is simply how much space there is between the grains whereas permeability is how much um, how fast water, or how the capacity for water to flow through the earth material. Um, if you have really fine grain material, um, it's 
the pro the permeability is much lower and you could test that out if you take that glass we're talking about or that jar and fill it full of sand and then dump the water out the water will um, dump out pretty quick but if you fill it through full of really fine grain clay or silt something much smaller than sand and you may have some in your backyard you could try um, it will it will it will pour out much more slowly well the connections between the pore spaces are wider in coarse grain material sand and gravel and they're much smaller between fine grain material so you may have the same exact porosity with clay and sand depending on sorting but uh, the permeability might be much lower between with the clay so if you're a geologist looking for oil you're looking for something with not just high porosity but something with high permeability so that rock, so that oil will flow through it and one of the things you're doing when you fracture and you have you know, seen fr about fracking in the news you fracture those water those um those deposit those um uh, rocks where oils out is that you're trying to increase the permeability so that that liquid will flow through it okay why do you think groundwater flows more slowly um, than water on the surface well it's because of permeability there's more friction when you have more grains and um, so the water can't float as quickly as it can just through a river the mathematical formula that talks about flow rate and we're talking about permeability so we're talking about flow rate how fast does water flow through water is called Darcy's law and a way to think about Darcy's law is it's the velocity of flow as being proportional to the hydraulic gradient well in this case K um, is a hydraulic conductivity or effective permeability that's a coefficient of perme permeability on the seepage coefficient in other words um, what we're talking about here is how fast does water flow through that groundwater so just remember that the velocity of flow how fast the water flows through the ground is proportional to the hydraulic gradient and um, so if you look at if you look at this I won't pick the whole formula apart but you got h1 and h2 notice h1 is is <coughs> is higher than H2 water flows downhill right so <clears throat> the difference between H1 and H2 is H1 minus H2 so the difference between that is um, is the uh, um, hydraulic is part of the formula of the hydraulic gradient but there's other factors taken into, into account continuing to look at the idea of permeability let's look at the discharge area which is the base level of the water that runs um, through the ground and close to the base level it just takes days for the water from the recharge area to go to base level uh, further up up um, further up the water table uh, it may take years for water to travel to the discharge area or even decades if it, it flows deeper and water that flows from the top of the uh, water table recharge area um, down to where um, uh, the lowest uh, ground lowest part of the ground syst water system is it may take thousands and thousands of years for water to flow um, to the discharge area base level so let's imagine we have three critical containers A, B, and C. A is filled with flour, B is filled with uncooked rice, and C is filled with coffee beans. So you can see we're talking about different sizes of, of material. What would happen if we pour water into each container and which would have the most permeability? And if you do this exercise you have to do it um, do it right away. You can't let it sit around because obviously those, um, those food things are going to soak up water. So we're not, we're not talking about soaking up water here. We're just talking about trying to get water through those grains. Well, it's relatively easy to pour water into containers of rice and coffee beans, um, but the water, the flour would not let pass water pass very quickly through it. And so the coffee beans would have the greatest permeability. But the porosity would be about the same. Porosity would be the same. So you can't look at the size of material as long as it's sorted well and talking about porosity.
it's the permeability that here's a little word problem to think about um, how long it takes um, and um, so if we have the Otis Air Force Base that is um, to the uh, left above the water table and we have Falmouth at base level on the ocean and both in Massachusetts and there's three kilometers between them which is um, 3,000 meters and water flows down the water table uh, toward base level at half a meter a day how long does it take water to get from Otis Air Base to Falmouth and um, so well if we take half a meter a day it's going to go one meter in two days and so it's going to go 3,000 meters in in 6,000 days we'll just multiply it by two also so 6,000 divided by 365 will be uh, 16 years so 16 years for that water to travel that three kilometers well groundwater is stored in bodies of rock or sediment and we and we call those uh, bodies of rock or sediment aquifers. It's an important word to know. Well, an aquifer um, is sufficiently saturated and permeable to, lead, to yield significant quantities of water. So an aquifer has to be uh, saturated and permeable and it has to also yield significant quantities of water to be called an aquifer. And aquifers around the United States are proposed composed of sand, gravel, sandstone, um, they have good porosity and permeability, and they may be in fractures. And so therefore we see the different types of aquifers. In, the, in A, the blue and yellow, those are sand and gravel aquifers. In the uh, B, those are sandstone aquifers, the green aquifers. The aquifers in the upper right C, the brown ones, are carbonate aquifers. And you can see carbonate aquifers that limestones are limestones and um, dolomites are carbonates. And those are the aquifers we find in uh, very far northeast of Oklahoma, northwest Arkansas, and south southern Missouri. And um, in D, we have uh, igneous rock aquifers. Well, why do we get those in the Appalachian Mountains? Because the roots of the Appalachian Mountains are um, igneous rocks. Now it says igneous rocks, it probably should be say igneous metamorphic rock aquifers, it'd be more accurate. And then E with a purple you get a combination of sandstone and carbonate aquifers. And so you see those in again the Appalachians area and then Southwest Texas. Aquifers can be different quality and so uh, if to be a good aquifer you have to have high porosity and permeability and most productive aquifers in the U.S. come from unconsolidated earth material. In other words, it hasn't lithified yet. And in other words, it, you haven't turned it into rock. Well, 80% of all groundwater withdrawn from the, in the U.S. comes from sand and gravel aquifers. Uh, another term that's important to know is aquitard. You have aquifer and aquitard. Well, an aquitard is a low permeability material like um, shale, clay, igneous rock or metamorphic rock that's not fractured and, wa and water doesn't flow through it. In other words, it's a barrier to the water flow. In general, the water table follows the shape of the land surface. It, it's not as steep as the land surface, but in general it follows the shape. So if you have a hill, the water table generally will go up the hill, just not as steep an angle, and then flows into the stream. And so there you see the black lines of flow through that aquifer, through the groundwater area. Um, what we, the term we use for the slope of the water table, and it's a term to know, is hydraulic gradient. Well, hydraulic just means water or liquid and gradient just means how steep is it so again it's a a lot of the terms here make make sense it's just we're using the terms for groundwater and um, you can get a recharge zone for the groundwater area that's not even close to where um, you may be standing and in this 
um, example, you get an aquifer and an aquitard, but the aquifer is, is squeezed between two different aquitards. And that confined aquifer is called an artesian aquifer. It's enclosed by um, perm impermeable material above and below it. And so there you have a rain getting into the aquifer in the mountains, flows into the aquifer, and then and you get an artesian well um, on downstream. And um, I remember when I was a, a kid in North India, we stayed at a farm just in the foothills of the Himalaya Mountains. It was called the Terai area. And there were um, artesian wells from the um, aquifers at the, that were flowing, you know, five, six feet above the surface of the, of the well, just spurting way up above the ground because of the pressure that was coming from that aquifer um, that was being recharged up the Himalaya Mountains. When you put a well into the, into the groundwater table and you start pumping water out of that well, you get a cone of depression around that well and it uh, takes a while for the water to fill in. If you pump too much water out of that well, um, you can run the well dry depending on how fast the recharge is um, back into the water. And so um, it's, it's, not, it's not something that you can just say is the recharge true everywhere because depending on the factors will depend on how fast that recharge is. Cone of depression. And here you see cones of depression with um, some three wells. And the, the top picture is, um, is wells that um, you see are, are drilled, but the only one with the cone of depression right now is the well on the left. And you can see that cone of depression around the well. Well, let's say that um, the, the middle well starts pumping water, and you can see it pumping water on the uh, field and you'll see these kind of uh, 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 pump systems all over with pivot irrigation in Candace, Nebraska and even even in the middle of uh, Arizona I've seen them as they fly over but notice what happens with the cone of depression as you start pulling that water down the other two wells dry up and so <clears throat> you have to be careful on who's using what water because um, you can cause problems for the neighbors you can even think of the water tower in your town as a groundwater system because um, it's delivering water the same exact principles to your house so here you have a water tower and it's um, creating water pressure and as you um, move your houses away from that water tower eventually you, you can see it will pinch out to the right you won't have enough water pressure for houses that are too far from the water tower so you have to put in another water tower and, and pump water up into it. So we're using the same principles for the water tower that we're using for water in groundwater system. Groundwater under land is made of fresh water. Groundwater under the ocean is salt water and here you can see a line of demarcation between fresh water and salt water. Salt water is more dense than fresh water, so fresh water lands will float on top of salt water underground. If you put a pump into the fresh water and begin pumping it out for some reason over land, if you pump that too hard, you're going to get that zone of depression uh, uh, going backwards in a certain way, but it's going to it's going to pull in that fresh water and decrease the lens of fresh water and you run the danger of um, having salt water impede into your freshwater lands. If you start doing that, it's, it's almost impossible to, uh, to, re to replace that, um, that salt water back with fresh water, at least in, in your life. So here's a cross section to think about uh, groundwater sources from a county in a Midwestern state. Uh, which location here would have the potential for the best groundwater production? So you have A, B, C, or D. So if you look at sand and gravel, that's the light color material. Blue is the shale. And then the uh, orangest part is the sandstone. And then you have a dotted line for the water table. So you're going to drill a well. 
and you're going to um, figure out which one is the best production and the answer would be D because you have unconsolidated material sand and gravel and um, it's in the lowest part of the water table and here we have three wells and you have um, liquid hazardous waste being disposed of down one of those injection wells by the way hazardous waste sounds like horrible thing but um, it could just be that it could be salt water from an oil well because when you pump water out of an oil well you get salt water with it and so you have to take that and put that salt water somewhere so you inject it back down another well and that would be one one liquid hazardous waste wouldn't be poisonous or anything it would just you wouldn't want oily salt water coming up in your neighbor's drinking water from their well. Um, so, which of the following diagrams would be most suitable for an injection well? Well, the answer would be A. The well B bottoms out a material that's impermeable and thus reduces its effectiveness as a storage reservoir for hazardous waste. And uh, well C is not as deep. And um, if you're going to put water down at the bottom of A, it's going down into a rock that um, that is not up close to the water table. If you put it down in C, you're putting it down into rock that um, joins the water table with uh, other uh, neighbor neighbor. So you have inflow and outflow in groundwater systems. Inflow is recharge. Outflow is discharge. Um, and recharge can occur through infiltration of rainwater or streams. Streams can be called losing streams or gaining streams. Well, a losing stream is a stream that flows over ground in dry areas and water is lost from the stream down into the groundwater. And that middle picture is a, is a, a picture of a losing stream. You know, basically, water is running down out of the river into the ground, into the groundwater table. And a gaining stream is the lower right picture where you gain water from an area with the high water table and um, this is a form of discharge of the groundwater into the stream. Uh, so the, the idea of recharge, it can occur from stored groundwater present from a wetter time in the past or from the present. And it's, um, you don't necessarily get recharge from water that just uh, rained recently. It may be um, rain or glacier meltwater that went down in the groundwater system from uh, thousands and thousands of years ago. Here we have another cartoon of the same idea where we have outflow and inflow. And um, now we've got to be careful here because we're talking from the perspective of groundwater, not from the stream. So don't get mixed up with um, discharge and recharge of the stream. We're talking about recharge or discharge from the groundwater. So here you get outflow in A from the groundwater into the stream, and so that'd be a gaining stream. And in B you get dis or recharge from the stream into the groundwater, so that'd be a losing stream. So if we look at these two graphs, we see a graph that shows the amount of discharge from a river, and um, one in Michigan and one in North Dakota. And notice the amount of discharge is quite a bit higher in the one from Michigan. So that would be the losing stream. And the amount of discharge is much lower in North Dakota in this particular graph. So that would be the gaining stream. Well, recharge, uh, we, we've talked about a confined aquifer or an artesian well. And it's just a uh, aquifer where water is under pressure. And water can flow uh, without pumping until the water table equals elevation where the water was withdrawn. And um, there's a fun picture there to the right of that uh, where you have a confined, in this case, it's, it's a picture of an oil well. I've, I've cheated. But um, it's the idea. You have a liquid under pressure, and that pressure um, creates a gusher. Well, the same thing that happen with water as with oil or anything else underground. You have liquid that's confined and it's under pressure and you poke a hole in it and it um, can come up above the surface of the earth. Well, let's do some cartooning of the
So we have water that's written and the line where it's, um, and then so you have an impermeable layer above it. And you have what's called a potentiometric surface that is the potential of where water can come up um, above that red line based on the pressure under. And so we go ahead and uh, put water, uh, put a well there, and at the top of that unconfined aquifer, the well will be at that um, level of the put. And if we go ahead and put a well further downstream, it's going to come up to that same level. Notice that it's still underground. And if we drill, drill another well on down, it's going to be a dry well because we didn't drill it deep enough. And if we drill it further downstream, you're going to have water flowing out of that well, and the whole well will fill up. And that's another artesian well. Both are artesian wells. One's just flowing above the surface, another one's flowing. Um, above the uh, potentiometric surface and because it, it rises above that level that's called an artesian well. So one's flowing and one's not. Both are artesian. And now you can get fractures in those rocks perhaps and if you do then the water is going to come up into those fractures from the um, confined aquifer and flow downstream and we call those springs and the nice thing about the spring is that you get water from the fresh clean water source from um, from sometimes water that's thousands of years old and you can drink that spring water if it's, if it's clean enough and hasn't been polluted. So the question here is how does groundwater interact with the oceans and um, in coastal regions, fresh water is found floating above the denser layer of the salt water. Salt water infiltrates the ground just like fresh water, and where fresh water layer meets the coast, it flows into the ocean. And so you have the yellow looking saline groundwater and the gray looking fresh water. And if you look at the picture on the left, you can see it's, we call it a lens, it's a lens of fresh water. And then you have a coastal well field, maybe a city along the coast, and it's putting uh, wells into the ground so that it um, can has water to drink and so on and so forth. Well if enough water is pumped out of those wells you can have what's called a salt water intrusion and start getting a problem with pumping water into the, those wells. We're going to change topics here a little bit and talk about Florida aquifers for a couple slides. And Florida is kind of unique because it's so close to the ocean and so this this um, issue of saltwater intrusion is a real problem in Florida and geologists that um, help make sure that you have uh, fresh water in Florida have to really, really pay attention to this. So here you have a surficial aquifer system in the, um, in the kind of purpley um, pink which is kind of through the center of the state and then the very far left of the state you have a sand and gravel aquifer well that's where um, the river systems um, next to uh, Alabama are flowing into the um, flowing into the uh, um, Gulf of Mexico and so that that, that side of the state is um, sand and gravel aquifer down by Miami you get what's called the Biscayne aquifer and then in the center of the state you get the Florida aquifer system with a confining unit so you get a shale or a clay that confines and separates the one aquifer from the other in Florida where you get that in the middle with that kind of blue area separated from the pink area and here you get another picture of that where you get a surface aquifer and then you get a confining layer of clay and then you get a intermediate aquifer and then confining layer under it and then you get the Florida aquifer underneath that which would be limestone and so if you're putting wells in Florida you really have to pay attention to which type of aquifer you're drilling into. One of the challenges in Florida is you have lots of limestone and so you have um, the additional challenge of some of that limestone um, can, uh, and we'll talk about karst topography um, in, in, in after 
in, in another lecture area. But uh, that limestone can um, get dissolved away and uh, create large, um, very permeable um, movement of water underground. Um, <clears throat> one of the things we have to think about when we um, get water out of the ground is as populations increase, you, you need more water. And one thing that happens is that you get what's called a groundwater overdraft. It'd just be like taking and pouring a spilled drink on a countertop or a table. And then you take a straw and start drinking it up. Well, um, the, the area around that straw is going to be um, removed and then it will be dry. And then you'll have to move the straw to another spot. So if you want to try that, go ahead and try it. But um, I've done it on a table. Well, that's called a, a zone of depression forms around the well. The straw would be the well, and that zone of depression would be where that area where the drinks were moved. And let's go ahead and look at some, hap some things that happen with um, moving water out of the ground. You get what's called subsidence. And so in these cases where water has um, been taken out of the ground, you then have uh, the ground uh, goes uh, contracts down and slumps or uh, some si subsides and so then you get cracks in sidewalks or cracks in buildings as the um, crack down with as the ground falls down. Here you have uh, groundwater that's subsided and so you get a real problem here in this house. Subsidence of the land just doesn't occur in a very local area like a cracked sidewalk or the corner of a building or something. In Southern California, um, there's lots of groundwater in some of the rich farming valleys and uh, the whole valley has subsided as a whole valley. And so if you look at the picture, there's a man standing there at the ground um, under some telephone poles or electric lines and that's the level of the ground in 1977. But that was the level of the ground in 1955, and that was the level of the ground in 1955. So the whole valley has shrunk down, what is that, if he's six foot tall, six, twelve, eighteen, maybe forty, fifty feet, um, just in that um, half a century because of pumping groundwater to water those crops. And that land will not uh, build back up again. Once it's subsided, it's, it's subsided and won't, won't um, puff back up again ever. Here's some more examples of subsidence. <laughs> Here you have a street sign that says subsidence area. Well, that's a um, water, uh, full, full water um, is keeping the uh, ground up to the level that it was at and you pump water out and that shrinks. So the Leaning Tower of Pisa, Pisa um, subsided and, uh, and uh, leaned. And the main cathedral in Mexico City leans to the left because that whole city of Mexico City, the whole groundwater system has subsided, has um, uh, had water pumped out of it and the whole city has subsided. Um, and here you have, a, in the lower right, you have subsidence around a lake. And so um, because of that, the trees have died because uh, um, they're saturated and killed the roots. And here's an example from Mexico City. And the whole city has subsided over time. And here you have an example from um, Chicagoland area, Wheaton, Illinois and you have groundwater subsidence there or um, land, land subsidence because of pumping out of groundwater is a better way to say that. Uh, you have subsidence in Venice, Italy. Um, so the, the buildings, it's, a, it's hard to keep the buildings uh, above ground as much as they need to be because of groundwater subsidence. In the last hundred years the city of Venice has gone down 24 centimeters. Be very worried about.
So human actions are something that creates groundwater subsidence more than anything. Well, when groundwater is rapidly removed from unconsolidated material, the grains compact and the empty spore, pore spaces um, close up with those grains. So here's a definition. A drop of the ground surface in response to the decrease in volume of the underlying sediments. Subsidence is due to groundwater withdrawal that has occurred in some of the world's largest cities and the San uh, Joaquin Valley, for example. And um, so you see subsidence in London, which would be um, uh, 0.3 meters, um, Venice, 0.2 meters, Shanghai, 2.6 meters, Bangkok, 1 meter. Um, San Joaquin Valley, 8.8 .8 meters, Denver, 0.3 meters, Houston, 2.7 meters, and Mexico City, 8.5 meters. So um, subsidence is something to be aware of and not to fear, but it's something that if, if you ever get into a position of, of, of planning how to manage water resources or in, in a political arena, then you got to be aware of this so you can pay attention to it. Let's say we have two wells A and B that are drilled into rocks that have the same porosity, but rocks around well A have the higher permeability than the, those around well B. Suppose both wells are pumped at the same rate, which statement is true? Well, well B will have the larger cone of depression. Um, why? Well, it mo most closely is related to the relationship between permeability and recharge. Well B will recharge more slowly than well A, so that will have a larger cone of depression. Well A, the water will um, go back into the well quicker, so the cone of depression won't stay low as long. Um, let's look at a case study for the High Plains Aquifer. Um, this is near and dear to my heart because I've lived in this part of the country um, for a good part of my life. Kansas, Nebraska, Texas, Oklahoma. Lived in all of those states actually. Uh, about two-thirds of the fresh U.S. groundwater is pumped um, from aquifers used for irrigation. And um, so there are lots of crops grown in those states from water that's pumped out of the aquifer. Well, um, much of those states was once dubbed the Great American Desert. Um, but um, if you poke a hole in the ground down into the Great the High Plains Aquifer, you can pump water out of there, um, maybe say a hundred meters below the surface, and irrigate your crops. And you can even go to a very dry part of western Kansas and there's folks that are irrigating, irrigating uh, corn um, with that water. And there's those well pumpers pumping water out of the ground for corn. Um, if you go to central Nebraska, the farmers are very wealthy close to the Platte River because they are pumping water out of that aquifer um, for corn and um, they do really well there. Here's the thickness of the High Plains aquifer. It's thickest in north central Nebraska um, and the uh, light colors, the yellow area, it's thinnest. But it's a it's an aquifer that was originally recharged or the Ogallala aquifer is the name of it. It was originally rechar uh, It was originally water that was put there thousands of years ago, and so when we pump water out of there, we're actually mining water out of the ground because it it uh, won't be recharged in um, any time that um, humans will be aware of. There's more than 170,000 wells that draw water from the High Plains aquifer, and there is no contemporary source of water to recharge it. It's fossil water is a good way to put it. Um, and the groundwater overdraft has caused a drop in the water table of up to 70 meters. Um, the graph to the left in blue shows the, shows the uh, thickness of the saturated zone. In other words, it's, it's how thick the aquifer um, is. And the center panel in brown shows rises and drops in the water table. 
and the yellow would be a rise in the water table. And you notice that follows along rivers mostly, like the Platte River in Nebraska, so the water table actually goes up there, just because the because just because of the river. And the uh, the brown is the uh, the dark brown is a hundred up to over a hundred foot decline in the water in the uh, water from that Ogallala Aquifer. And you notice that um, some of the driest parts of western Kansas and west Texas has gone down the most. Um, so appro approximately 11 percent of the total groundwater supply has been extracted and it will not return to this aquifer. Well what's the best explanation for the changes in water level for the High Plains aquifer? Well C is the best answer because the number of water wells have been drilled in the aquifer and um, withdrawal exceeds recharge. There's basically no recharge and so um, you're losing water from that. Um, let's look at uh, let's look at an example of that. You have um, two cross sections. One starts in eastern Wyoming and goes to eastern Nebraska and um, then you have a cross section from Kansas to South Dakota. So one goes west to east and the bottom one goes south to north. And so if we look at if we look at those aquifers and kind of what the aquifers look like um, east to west or west to east um, from Wyoming to Nebraska you see the aquifer is really thick under Nebraska and you notice from Kansas to Nebraska you have a thicker aquifer under Nebraska well the corn lands a lot better in Nebraska and that's one reason for it you have that great aquifer under it well, much of the agriculture in the middle of the United States relies on water from the High Plains aquifer. So what's the long-term implications? What's going to happen in the long term? Well, we're going to have to manage that water. It's, um, it's, there's some renewability in some states, um, but it's largely limited in the far west, um, especially like in West Texas. You're not going to get um, water back under that aquifer again. And that's because it was filled during the last glacial period and we don't need another continental glacier refilling it, but that's the only way that would be filled up again. Okay, we're going to change subjects here and look at karst topography. Um, karst topography is when um, a limestone or a, a, um, other rocks like limestone, there's a rock called dolomite, which is a magnesium calcium carbonate, not just a calcium carbonate. And water will um, dissolve that limestone and create um, what we call karst topography. Let's look at some of the features that get shown with karst topography. Um, here you get um, these limestone, I don't know what, you wouldn't call them hills or cliffs, but they're shards just sticking up above ground where water has leached away. Um, differentially leached away uh, calcium carbonate from around them. And here you get in uh, China uh, carbonate hills that are um, create some really pretty topography around China. But that's from karst. Um, the, the differential uh, weathering away, chemical weathering away of limestone by water. And um, <clears throat> here you get sinkholes and springs a diagram you can see sinkholes and springs where um, water or groundwater is leaching away and creating caverns underground and then the top of the ground crashes in and creates a cave or a sinkhole and um, it's a you see a lot of this in Florida and here's an above ground picture of um, karst topography where you have sinkholes or lakes, and um, uh, it's something to pay very close attention to if if you're uh, doing any kind of building planning in a area where you have sinkholes and springs because of karst. Here's a cave that uh, has um, been created by karst topography, where um, the Groundwater is leached away limestone underground to the point where the roof of the ground caved in. And um, you, you can, if that's dry, you can walk on through it. And um, if it's wet, um, scuba divers 
um, often will go explore um, vast networks of um, caves developed by this karst um, um, and here's here's some more pictures of caves that were formed because of that differential weathering of limestone uh, here's a sinkhole uh, because it's another karst feature I might call that I think that's called a blue hole and um, it'll go way down deep underground and if you're a scuba diver it's very dangerous but it's a really interesting to go explore those underground water caves um, the left is a beautiful spring or beautiful a karst um, sinkhole with water in it you can go swimming and on the right um, not so fun that's pretty rough to lose your house when you have a sinkhole open up underneath you. Um, you can also have geysers around with as a karst feature where you have a sinkhole in the limestone or a, a area in the limestone where you can have magma underneath it and that magma can heat up the water and then it boils and then suddenly it blows up the tube and then it, it lets off the steam and then it uh, boils up again and lets off the lets up out of the tube again and so that's the process where you get a, a uh, the, this karst feature uh, a geyser is one of those and so when you see uh, when you see a geyser that's um, perhaps the way that that geyser is um, having a regular um, uh, spray of water coming up um, just um, say every minute or every every hour because it takes a regular amount of time for that water to boil in that karst cave and then release pressure and come on up the pipe again although natural groundwater is not pure in the US it typically typically contains a few chemicals that to cause harm so a lot of times you can drink groundwater however depending on what's in the uh, in the uh, regolith or the rocks that the groundwater is in you can have harmful contamination and an example of that is in Bangladesh the rocks in Bangladesh have arsenic in them and so um, in Bangladesh we may have the worst mass poisoning in the world and um, the problem is is that um, we've created wells to help people get clean drinking water in Bangladesh because people used to drink polluted surface water and then wells started getting drilled in the 70s to give people nice clean fresh water but the problem is those wells are drilled into um, rocks that have arsenic in them so people may be getting mass arsenic poisoning in Bangladesh because of that quote fresh pure groundwater. If we look at a map of where Bangladesh is and Dhaka is the capital of Bangladesh it's it's the mouth of the um, Ganges and the Brahma, Brahmaputra River that come together so the whole the uh, whole country it's a real problem to have clean surface water from the rivers because it's the mouth of the river and if you look at the map you can see how much uh, the, where the field test positive for arsenic the darker green are more arsenic the lighter greens are less arsenic and the worst affected wells are at the um, south of the uh, confluence of both both rivers and the rocks coming out of the Himalayas have an unnatural unusually high natural concentration of our concentration of arsenic it could be that half the population of Bangladesh has been exposed to arsenic levels above the um, standard that's been set by the World Health Organization and those drill wells that have been drilled into um, drilled into the groundwater there in Bangladesh well in the United States um, there's areas that have lots of arsenic levels in wells as well also and these parts of the states that have more igneous and metamorphic rocks tend to have more arsenic in them so you have the red there the orangey colors being high arsenic levels 
and the green um, being the next high and the lighter green being less and the gray there just not any data so the U.S. also has some areas that do have high arsenic levels in the groundwater and so the people living there have to be really careful. Uh, nature can cause contamination in groundwater like arsenic but it's usually human activities that cause uh, the problem, most of the problems for, for that um, contamination. And there's two terms that you need to know around um, the sources of groundwater quality. One is point source and one is a non-point source. Well a point source can specifically be identified and located. In other words you can find a leaking gasoline storage tank that that um, is a source of pollution for groundwater. And um, um, once you find that then you can go fix it. A non-point source occurs over a right area and it's hard to know where that comes from. Well some examples of things that humans use to contaminate groundwater with would be chemicals like benzene or nitrates. Nitrates might come from a nitrogen fertilizer on, on farmland or, or on, on, um, on, a, um, on your yard. You fertilize your yard, most of that fertilizer doesn't go into the ground. It runs off and gets into the groundwater system and um, pesticides get into uh, get into groundwater. And you put um, a weed killer on your lawn and that lawn that gets into the groundwater. And um, microbes coming from feces, from human and animal feces, get into groundwater. Well, potential sources of groundwater pollution in the United States um, would be um, from agriculture animal waste in agriculture as well as fertilizer and pesticides in agriculture and also bad septic systems in the United States are, and this is worldwide too bad septic systems would uh, put raw sewage in the groundwater and then landfills or illegal dumps or uh, metal coal mines um, put some pollution into groundwater so for example in northeast Oklahoma you have the lead and zinc areas that um, have huge piles of old lead and zinc talus from those mines that just a few years ago is closed and they're leaching it's not not illegal it's just um, old mines and it's leaching um, lead and zinc into the groundwater there as that weathers away and so here we have groundwater quality as an example, you have a here um, the top picture. You have a septic tank, and the septic tank, if it's not built right, or if it's not managed properly, um, can go ahead and leak uh, sewage down through the groundwater into the person's well down downstream. And uh, we're talking about underground stream, or in the in the case of the um, lower picture you have a septic system and that septic system can leach sewage down into the groundwater into the well that the person has so it has to be it can either come uh, right down a, a layer of um, impermeable rock like the top picture or right through the uh, groundwater system um, in the lower picture well in this case um, let's look at um, what do you do if you have a problem with a, a well that you need to get drinking water from and a sewage system and um, things that can happen that you have to pay attention to are you might have built the top picture where you have um, a septic system and a well for your water for your house and that works fine because the septic system is is downhill and it's moving sewer away um, from that septic system um, on downhill from away from you and your water is nice and clean because it's uphill but then what happens is you drill another well in the lower picture to water your field and that'd be a pivot irrigation system on the right and it it drills uh, mines more water out of the groundwater system and um, then what it does, it lowers the cone of depression and lowers the cone of depression 
for your house well, which then pulls sewage into your house well because now water is running downhill the other way from the septic tank. So um, you got to be careful uh, depending on where those wells are and the concepts of uh, water. Um, uh, these cones of depression from different wells and water um, running downhill from one place to another. You got to pay attention to the geology underground to make sure you don't cause problems. Here's one of these cartoons that you want to right click and click play on if it doesn't play automatically. And that's um, here you have a water table and everything's fine. You start pumping water out of that, that water table and it creates a zone of depression. And so because you have that zone of depression, now from the city landfill you have um, pesticides and heavy metal going into your water and out of your well. You didn't before, but once you started pumping, you do now. So you've got to pay attention to where these pump these wells are as compared to where these sources of pollution are. Well, in a summary question, let's think about this Bangladesh uh, arsenic contamination problem. Is that a point source or a non-point source of pollution? Well, it's a non-point source because the source can't be directly identified. And it's important to think of point or non-point source from a geographical standpoint because um, there's no one geographical spot where you can say this, the pollution came from that one place. Whereas the slide we just looked at, you could actually say the source of pollution came from the city landfill. So it would be a point source. But Bangladesh, because it's generally everywhere, or lots of places geographically, it's non-point. So in summary, let's look at a Venn diagram of comparing human actions to, not, to natural source of groundwater quality. And human actions, with, um, 1, 5, 8, and 11. Uh, groundwater issues can occur anywhere there are people. Number one, number five, um, occurred rel in relative recent past. Number eight, is typically associated with a point source. And number 11, once identified, pollution source can be cleaned up. Well, natural sources, two, six, nine, and 12 can occur, um, can occur anywhere. Number six may have a, be occurring for millions of years, like that arsenic in the, um, arsenic in the, uh, um, rocks in Bangladesh has been there for millions of years. Um, number nine is typically associated with non-point source and 12 once identified pollution source often cannot be cleaned up. So human actions are just the opposite of natural sources in your strategy of how to how to manage the improved groundwater quality. And both um, number three um, may not be obvious to those using the system and may take an expert to come in and pay attention uh, who understands the geology and, and understands groundwater to work with that. Um, so yeah, number four, geology does affect it. Number seven, contamination can cause illness and death. And number nine can, can be mitigated by using clean water. So like we started the lecture with, um, clean water in abundant fresh supply is the biggest problem that, um, um, the biggest natural problem that many people in the world have worldwide. Okay, we're going to change subjects now and have a few slides on wetlands. Um, a wetland is an area that's saturated with water and has poorly drained soils and specific types of, and specific types of plants. There's a coastal type of wetland and a freshland, freshwater type of wetland. And so there we see a wetland on B with a uh, kind of an estuary where we have a salty, briny, fresh water, but it's not ocean, total ocean water. And there's a whole uh, ecosystem built up around a coastal wetland. And there you have on the right side a freshwater wetland with um, a swamp and specific kind of plants like cypress trees and things growing out of the swamp. Or in order to create a, a wetland, groundwater reaches a surface at a spring or at a wetland, either one. And a spring forms where you have fractures or a cave system that intersects with the land surface, whereas a wetland forms where you have a small springs 
that distribute water over a region and it's underlain by low permeability materials such as um, clay or shale. So the picture on the right shows you a wetland because you have a spring seeping water out over that um, over the surface of the ground but it doesn't have anywhere to go so it just kind of sits on top of that shale. And in order to be a wetland you have to have the following and this is important to know um, because these three things are, are, the, are required in order to have a wetland, official wetland. One is you have to have a hydrologic condition. In other words, water has to be present on the land surface or soils in the root zone must be saturated during the growing season or longer. So just because you have water on the surface doesn't make it a wetland. Um, the, you have to have um, the root zone of the plants there have to be saturated during the growing season or longer than the growing season. Secondly, you have to have vegetation that's hydrophytic. In other words, plants that are water tolerant or grow under wet conditions like cattails, wild rice, willow trees, sawgrass, um, I mentioned cypress trees. Um, in other words, they have to be water to tolerant and they have to be able to grow under wet conditions. And then thirdly, you have to have a soil that's hydri hydric. In other words, a poorly drained soil that exhibits anaerobic or lack of oxygen conditions during growing season. So hydric soil is a soil that um, um, exhibits non-oxygen or anaerobic conditions during the growing season. And there you have some pictures of different types of wetlands around the United States. The left picture is from the Florida Everglades. The second to left picture would be a um, an estuary and the third picture would be it looks like it's a bog and the fourth picture would be a uh, looks like a southern southern swamp in the lower 48 states the largest wetlands are in Texas Florida and Minnesota and outside of Alaska wetlands have declined by uh, about 55 percent since the 1600s in the United States the good thing about that is we have less mosquitoes and less malaria. We used to have a lot of malaria in the United States because of the wetlands. And But swamps got drained, and when they got drained, um, health got improved. On the other hand, wetlands are critical for um, uh, biological diversity. And uh, um, if you look at California, Ohio, and Iowa, you only have 10% of the original wetlands in those areas. Well, that's because farms in Iowa drained wetlands to put in uh, farmland and used to have malaria in Iowa back when my great-grandfather lived there. But no more because those farms have drained the swamps. And in California, um, those same thing, the agriculture has drained wetlands area and uh, cities have drained wetlands area. Um, but there is a law that says if you, now if you drain wetlands area, you have to put a wetland back somewhere else. In other words, you have to have, um, um, you, you can't just drain a wetlands area because otherwise, you know, <laughs> it's, it's kind of funny, but where, where would ducks land if you didn't have a wetland? You, you have to have wetlands for certain type of ecosystems to work or, or you lose those equal ecosystems. It's interesting to look at the 20th century and look at the changes in uh, the priorities over the 20th century. In the early 20th century, there were four goals, dike it, dam it, divert it, and drain it. And 50% of the original wetlands were lost at that time. And it's because what was really important during that time was development and um, development of uh, the ability, say, in the um, in Florida during the Everglades to, to plant sugarcane. And so you had the Ever, Everglades dike it, dam it, divert it, and drain it so that you could plant sugarcane, for example, or build um, the cities along the coasts of southeast Florida. But that changed um, in the late 1900s or late 20th century um, with the loss of wetlands and uh, realizing that the environmental impact of loss of those ecosystems and so the laws change so that it's um, you can't just <laughs> the four goals um, need a little cute saying but it, it um, you have to have uh, if, if you if you if you 
lose 100 acres of wetlands one place, you have to gain 100 acres of wetlands somewhere else. And the developer that does that has to go be aware of that in order to, um, to negotiate developing one area that might be a loss of wetlands to, to redevelop another area to gain in wetlands. Okay, just to summarize from wetlands, I'll go ahead and put the answer up there. After a series of summer thunderstorms, Kathy's lawn is covered with a shallow pond of water up to 15 centimeters, 6 inches deep in places. The water remains for nearly 10 days. Does that make her yard a wetlands? Well, no, it doesn't because it doesn't match all three conditions of hydric conditions with hydrophytic plants and not it just doesn't mat, just doesn't count to have a wet soil to have a wetlands and um, so the plants in her yard are not hydrophytic plants and let's just um, compare wetlands to ground and if we look at wetlands number two they're used for recreation number five they contain vegetation number six contain poorly drained soils number nine they're above ground Number 12, they may reduce the effects of flooding. Number 14, an example of wetlands is the Florida Everglades. And um, if we look at groundwater, the uh, number one, it's a source of drinking water, primary source. Number eight, it's below ground. And number 15, an example of groundwater is a high plains aquifer. Um, then together, number three, um, both are the part of the hydrologic cycle. Number four, both are involved in the slow flow of water. Number both, number 10, are affected by agriculture practices. Both, number 11, may be polluted doing human, act human actions. So that's just a little bit of summary here.